If you have a Bible, uh, you want to go to 1 Samuel. Uh, it's in the Old Testament, because that's where we have been and will continue to be for a couple more weeks. Hopefully you're keeping up with your, devotion, your devotional reading. Uh, if you don't have a book, a devotional book, we still have some of those that you can uh, go by the church office and get one, or we might have one actually out in, the, or a few out in the uh, rotunda area at our, at our welcome desk. And uh, it, it's a great series that we're in together as a church family. And I love it when we do this because we're all together on the same page. We're, we're, we're preaching about it. We're talking about it in our Bible study groups, and we're doing devotionals about that. And it just seemed, it, it's just good for us as a church to periodically come together and, and just really focus on one thing. And so that's, that's what we're doing. And, and guests, I'm glad that you're here. And uh, uh, if this is your first time in church or first time back in church, um, I, again, we, just, we want you to just sit, listen. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to ask. I'll be in the rotunda afterwards. We can talk. Our pastor will be there. But anyway, just it's just good to, to be with you this morning. Um, any, any procrastinators in here? Just a little show of hands. Good. We're going to have a, a, a support group meeting after this is over. So I, I just want to tell you, I hit the height of my procrastination my freshman year in college. Um, that, that's when I was at my peak. Um, I, I was next level procrastinator at that point. And here's the crazy thing uh, about college is you have this tremendous amount of freedom that you never really had in high school. Um, or at least when I was in high school, um, late 80s, early 90s, there, there, it, it was, you know, there wasn't a lot of, of freedom. Now I know it's different. But I'd never experienced, until I got to college, I'd never experienced this, this whole thing of only having certain classes on certain days. Uh, when I, where I, I went to Hardin Simmons until we had Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes, and we had Tuesday, Thursday classes. I, and I'd never experienced that before. And, and, and so th this, this whole idea, my thought process was, as a procrastinator, I have a class on Monday, they've assigned homework, so why would I go home and do my homework then? It's not due until Wednesday, so I will wait until late Tuesday night, and I will do my homework. This whole idea of getting ahead, that was really a, a, a concept that seemed quite unnecessary to me. Um, and, and in college, they gave you this thing that, that was called a, a syllabus. I don't know if you know what those are, but um, I, I'd never seen one before. And so, I, and in the syllabus, it, it told you all about the assignments and when they were due. And they would give you assignments on there that weren't due for weeks, for weeks. And so that, that was a procrastinator's dream. Look at all of the things that I can put off until later. And I loved it. And so I, I had the time of my life uh, my freshman year, or first semester of freshman year in college, because I had time to do all the things that I wanted to do. I golfed like crazy my freshman year in college. Uh, I, I think I almost, almost every day is not an exaggeration. Uh, I, I loved to golf, and, and so I did it. Like, I worked at my church. I was an intern at my church, and our, 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 we had a, a recreation building, activities ministry is what we called it, and so I interned there and interned with, with our student ministry, and so I was up there at the gym playing basketball, playing racquetball, playing ping pong, hanging out with students, because it was all for the Lord. So, man, this was great. Um, I met Shonda, my, my, my wife. I met Shonda my first semester in college, so I was busy stalking her all over campus. Um, it, and it was, it, college was great. Every, I made, every day I made choices to do what I wanted to do, and then <laughs> it all caught up to me. It all caught up to me. I was in my house, and when I say my house, I mean my parents' house, because I, I grew up in Abilene, and I stayed in Abilene to go to school. So my fraternity was, was mama, papa, brother, and I was a part of that one. And uh, so I went to college. So I still lived at home. It was cheaper to live at home. And so I had, I had a 12-page research paper that, that, that was due, that, was, that, that it was on that syllabus, and it was due. And guess when it was due? The next day. Okay? It was due the next day. And guess how much time... I had, this, I had spent working on it. And remember, before you answer, I was a professional procrastinator back then. So how much time do you think I'd spent on it? Zero. You guys are good. You guys are good. I had spent exactly zero time on it. And by the way, just those of you who are still in high school, going to college, in college, I don't recommend this lifestyle. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't condone this lifestyle at all. But anyway, so I wish I could claim ignorance, but I couldn't because I had the syllabus. Our professor in, in this class had mentioned the paper periodically in class. Hope you're working on it. Uh, and I knew when it was due, but as a procrastinator, I had plenty of time. I couldn't blame it on anything else but myself. And I remember, this is where I, I know I'll have to turn in my man card, but I remember sitting on my couch at home. I was an 18-year-old freshman 
in college, and I sat on the couch, and I just started crying, okay? And not just, <laughs> I mean, bawling, because I had a 12-page paper due in less than 24 hours, and I hadn't done squat. And I remember thinking, why did I do this? How, how did I let this happen? And I tell you how it happened. You know how it happened? I ignored facts so that I could have fun. I absolutely ignored the facts of my life, the facts of what was before me so that I could have fun. And I could see this coming, but I completely ignored the reality of my situation because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. You ever been there? Yeah. And here's the deal. This is the first thing in your outline. Every choice leads somewhere. I know that's, that's not this, this big aha moment, or maybe, maybe it, it is for you, but and it, it was for me at this point, but every choice leads somewhere. The decisions that we make in life, big ones and small ones, they take us somewhere. Choices that we make in relationships, choices that we make at school, choices that we make at home, in our marriages with our kids, choices we make at work, choices that we make about our priorities, about our finances, about our habits, all of our choices, they lead us somewhere. Now this morning we're going to look at two guys who, actually, who had the same job and they were appointed to that job by the same God, uh, but who made two very different life decisions. And each of their decisions took them somewhere. For one, for, for Saul, it led him to being removed from his job. And for the other, for David, it led him to be actually the greatest at his job in, in the history of of Israel. As a matter of fact, it was through David's line that would eventually come Jesus, the Messiah. We're going to look at those two guys. They both faced, and here's the choice, the, the choice that, that how they kind of, the choice they made at the beginning that led to a bunch of other choices that they made that took them to a destination. And here's the choice. Live for themselves or live for God. And by the way, that's a choice that we, me, me, you, that we all get to make daily. So I want to read uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 13, um, I'm going to read one verse, and then we're going to turn over to chapter 16 and read um, one verse. Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel chapter thir 13, verse 14, and this is actually the, uh, the verse that we read in the, um, in the children's sermon. And so this is Samuel, and he's talking to Saul. And in verse 14 it says, But now your reign will not endure the Lord has found a man after his own heart, which he's talking about David, and the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people because you have not done what the Lord commanded. Saul's choice took him somewhere, and he lost the kingdom. And then you turn over to chapter 16, look at verse 7, and it says this. This is Samuel, the Lord talking to Samuel. Samuel's been been asked to go appoint the new king that's going to take over Saul's place. And so Samuel is, is looking at all the people, and here's what the Lord says to Samuel. Do not look at his appearance or his stature, because I've rejected him. Humans do not see what the Lord sees, for humans see what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. So a quick, quick history lesson in case you're, 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 this is the first time you're here and, and, and you're new to all this, you don't know what's going on. Um, just to kind of catch you up, and we're going to go really fast through this. The people of Israel have been led by God. They were in slavery in Egypt, and they've been led by God uh, this whole time. The Lord was, he was the ruler uh, of Israel, and God led the people uh, through different people that he appointed, uh, Moses, Aaron, Joshua, and then priests, then judges, uh, that God had raised up to govern the people. And in Samuel's time, the people began to worry, um, the Samuel the prophet, they began to worry because Samuel's sons actually did not love God, did not follow God, and so they were, they were real worried about who was going to be next, who was going to be the next voice of God in their lives. Uh, and so what they did was, is they actually asked Samuel, hey, tell God, we, or God, we want a king. And, and, and not because we think, God, we want, we want to search after your heart or search after your, you know, we want to do what's right in your eyes, God. They said, we want to be like a king. We want us a king because everyone else around, all these powerful people around us, they have kings, and so we want to be like them. So they asked for a king, but God, that, that was not God's plan for them at this point, but they kept on. And, and so God gave them what they asked for. 
They didn't trust God's way. Their request for a king was really a rejection of God's leadership over them. And when the Israelites asked for a king in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 8, God, God says that, that, that he told Samuel, listen, don't worry about that. Don't worry about, you don't worry about this because they're not rejecting you. They're actually rejecting me. And that was the core of their sin because, like I said earlier, they wanted a king to be like all the other nations. But God's plan for Israel was for, not for them to be like all the other nations. God was their king, and he ruled them directly. And he spoke to his people through, through the leaders that I mentioned and, and others, and he spoke to them through Samuel. But that wasn't, that wasn't enough for them. They didn't, want to, they didn't want a simple prophet speaking God's word to them. They, they wanted a strong, they wanted a mighty king like all the kings that they've seen uh, it with, uh, in all the countries ar- around them. And they forgot the Lord literally just forgot how strong he was and how mighty he was and how all of the things that he delivered them from. So God gave them what they wanted, even though he warned them through Samuel. He said that this, is, this, this choice that you're making, this, you know, this is going to take you somewhere, and you're, ultimately this isn't going to be good for you, but they wanted it anyway. And by the way, just a side note here, if we continue as, as a people— or as an individual, if we continue to distance ourselves from God, if we continue to choose something or someone over him, he's not going to force us to follow him. Matter of fact, if we continue to, to request for something other than God over and over and over again, eventually what will happen is he'll honor our request. So Saul is appointed king by God, and he was a king who started off okay, but quickly he went south. And so, so God appoints David, and David is going to be the, the next king. And the interesting thing about David is he's really a nobody uh, when he's chosen, and he's not in the bloodline of, of Saul. Saul had a son. Uh, Saul had Jonathan, but, but God did not choose uh, for, for the king to be coming, come out of Saul's bloodline. So, so he chose uh, David. Um, God went a completely different route. And, and we saw in 1 Samuel 13, 14, we just read, Saul chose not to do what the Lord had commanded. And then later in that verse, remember we read, it said, and David was a man that was really after God's own heart. The choices that Saul and David made, it, they both, those choices took them somewhere. Saul's choices, his choices as king took him away from God, and David's choices actually took him to the very heart of God. And did you catch, we read 1 Samuel 16, 7, it says, God's more impressed with the condition of the heart than he is with what we would typically look at and see as impressive, or we would be really like, man, that is, that's really cool. In God's economy, the, the condition of the heart, your, your heart is going to determine your success in life. It's not really going to be your, your, your finances. It's not going to be your fame. It's not going to be your resume. It's not going to be your beauty or your good looks. It's not going to be your, your accomplishments. Those, those are, there's nothing really wrong with those things, but when, those, when you choose to follow those things, Instead of choosing to follow God, those things will, will leave you feeling empty. Those things are going to leave you unfulfilled. They're, and ultimately, they're going to leave you unsatisfied. So God, what God looks at is, is not the outward accomplishments, but what he looks at is at the heart. And your heart will determine your choices. Or another way to say that is our choices reveal our priorities. Our choices reveal our priorities. First Samuel uh, fifteen twelve says this. It says, Samuel got up early in the morning to go meet Saul. This is when, when Saul is, is king. And he was told, Saul went to Carmel, where he, and listen to what he's doing, where he is setting up a monument for himself. And then Samuel left and went, and then he left and he went down to Gilgal. So Saul, actually what's happened here is Saul gets a victory in this battle that he's fought. And, oh, by the way, it's a battle that he was told to go fight by God. God spoke through Samuel and said, this is what you need to do. And God was handing these people over to Saul because of how these people had previously treated the, the Israelites, the people of Israel. So Saul goes and he fights the battle that God sent him to and that God told him, I am giving these people over to you. Uh, and, and, so, and to commemorate the victory, what Saul does is he gives all praise and glory to God false that's not at all what he did he chose to construct a monument to himself he was wanting to draw attention to his victory did you just see what did you see what i just did we just destroyed this army 
okay? Ignore the fact that God told me to do this. Ignore the fact that God was giving these people over to me. Did you see? Did you see what I just did? Saul, king of Israel, do you see the victory? And he, const- he chose to construct a monument to him. And you could call this, hey, well, this was, some, this was a moment of weakness for Saul. He kind of got caught up. You know, we get excited. We get caught up in, 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 in the emotion. But if you read more about Saul, this isn't, this isn't a moment of weakness. This is a pattern of behavior. You see, his choice to give himself the trophy was, was because his first love was himself. What is, what is, whatever is in your heart will eventually expose itself through your actions, through, through what you say, through, through how you live life. Um, one of the coolest things uh, I, I get to see in, in the mornings now is um, I get to watch the, you ever watch a sunrise, a sun come up? And I know some of you like to go off in the mountains and, and spend time in nature, and that's cool. But, you know, the sun comes up here in Allen, too, and it's really cool. Um, and so you, you can go out and watch it. And um, now I'm not, a, let, let me, let me, stop right there and tell you I am not a morning person at all and the only reason I'm watching the sun come up is because I have to take my daughter to marching band at 6 30 in the morning so it just happens to correlate that that the sun is coming up then and so it's not like I'm this super uber early guy so don't call me at 6 30 on, on any other day because um, I'll delete you from my phone but so I, I get to see this so I'm taking Catherine to band and, and and we we I point it out to her she points it out to me and, and we say look at that and if you notice when the sun comes up, and I know it's probably pollution or the clouds, but you just see all the crazy colors, right? You see purples, and you see pinks, and you see reds, and you just see all this. I mean, it's just, it's just, over, it's just kind of awesome, a little bit overwhelming. And, and, and I, I, I say to my, I, I kind of pray to myself, and, and I just say, thank, God, thank you for letting me see that. Uh, that that's, that's cool. And, and, and thank you, God, that, that you, you're doing that, that you're, you're bringing up the sun this morning. And I'm, bl- I'm blown away by the big stuff that God does. And, and usually, usually, I'll, I'll give God credit for those things. and Because and I, I want to give God his props. He's God. He made the sun come up. But you know where I, I take a lot of credit for things in life? It's, it's in the smaller stuff. You know, sure, I, I can't make the sun rise, okay? I, I, I can't do it. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, a pretty, I'm a pretty good husband. I'm a pretty good dad. Just ask them over there. They'll tell you. I'm pretty good. I mean, do you, do you, I'm, I'm just kind of an overall nice guy. You know, I, I, I get things done. Um, you, I could show you my calendar from last week and just all the things that I accomplished. You know, and, and, and all the, the, the stuff. And, and, you know, and, and it's in a lot of the little things where, sure, you know, I, the big stuff, I know that's not me, that's God. But in the, the more everyday little stuff, that's kind of where I'm going, hey, look at me. Look what I did. Look, 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 I'm a pretty, sw- I'm, I'm a pretty swell guy. Swell, who says swell? Brother Chad says swell, I don't say swell. I'm a pretty uh, jazzy guy, I don't know, I don't know, I'm lost. Anyway, but here's the deal. I may not be constructing a physical monument to myself, but I'm certainly constructing one in my heart. I'm constructing one in my heart. In reality, here's the truth. And anything good in my life is a result of God working in my life. And that's just period. It's God working through my life, giving me the strength, energy, wisdom, love, capabilities, everything, everything that's needed in order to have a God-defined success in my life. I've got zero to do with it. If there's anything good in me, anything that, 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 is, that, that points people to Christ, anything that in me that, that people would look at and go, awesome, that's all God. That is all God. Saul made a monument to Saul because Saul was all about Saul. I'll say that again. Saul made a monument to Saul because Saul was all about Saul. I make a monument in my mind and in my heart sometimes because sometimes I'm all about me. I'm all about Jimmy. And the choice to be all about me leads me somewhere. It does. It leads me somewhere. It leads me to ignore God. It leads me to love me more than God. It leads me to, to, to feel like that people owe me something because, hey, look, I am good. My family owes me something because I'm a pretty decent 
pretty decent guy at home. Hey, you guys as a church, you owe me something because I'm a pretty decent guy around here or, or whatever. You owe me something because I'm such a good dude. And that leads me to make much of me instead of making much of Christ. And guess what? That path leads me nowhere good really fast. Acts 13, 22, this is uh, Paul preaching. Uh, and he's kind of going through a quick history of the people of Israel trying to get from, from where they were in Egypt to, to the point where Jesus came on the earth. And he says this, and he's referencing David. He says, after uh, removing him, he's talking about Saul, he raised up David as their king and testified about him. This is God testifying about David. He says, I have found David, the son of Jesse, to be a man after my own heart. And look at the next part, who will carry out all my will. Not some of it, but he's going to carry out all of it. You know why David carried out the will of God? Because his heart was surrendered to God. David's actions as king made much of God because God was made much in David's heart. His actions as king made much of, of God because God was made much in David's heart. David knew he was king because God appointed him to be king. David wasn't a great man of status. He wasn't a wealthy man. In fact, if, if you know the story of when he was chosen, he wasn't even there. Samuel went, Samuel went to, to the house of Jesse because God said, that's where I want you to go because the king is there. And so Jesse brought out all of his sons. And, Dave, and God said, nope, it's not any of these. And Samuel said, okay, is there anyone else? And David was kind of an afterthought. Oh, yeah, there's, there's David, the youngest, but he's out, he's out tending the sheep. They didn't even think about asking him to even come. That's how worthy they thought that he was. But David understood that, so when he's chosen, David understood that the victory that he would have was because he served a victorious God. And to make much of himself would have been foolish. It would have been misplaced credit or misplaced glory, and it would ultimately lead to his destruction if that's what he did. And so the question becomes, what's important to you? What's important to me? And you can find out quickly by looking at your choices that you've made in the last week, maybe even in, in, in the last month. Your priorities will quickly be exposed by how you choose to live your life. And here's the thing. Choosing selfishness is choosing to ignore your God-given purpose. Choosing selfishness is choosing to ignore your God-given purpose. Saul was appointed by God to be king. Saul had marching orders. Saul had expectations placed on him. Saul had a God-given purpose that he actually chose to ignore. 1 Samuel 13, 13 says, Samuel said to Saul, You have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment, the Lord your God, which he commanded for, commanded you. For, listen to this, if you had obeyed, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel. And what does it say? Forever. If you would have done God's purpose for you, if you would have obeyed, he would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. And I read that and I think how incredibly sad for Saul. That because of his decision, his decision to follow lesser things, his decision to love himself more than love God, it literally took him down a path where he missed the God-appointed purpose for his life. His choice to not obey God, to continually disobey God's direction, to continually choose himself over God, that kept him from following God's purpose. Now contrast that with David. 1 Samuel 24, 6. Look, I'm going to read these two verses to you. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord. And he's talking about Saul. The Lord's anointed to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David is, I'm going to tell you what all this means here in a minute. 1 Samuel 26, 9. It says, but David said to Abishai, do not destroy him, for who can put out his hand against the Lord anointed and be guiltless? Now, some of you know the context of these two stories or where these verses come from. But uh, not surprisingly, Saul, once, once he realizes that God has taken away uh, the, his, his throne and he's no longer going to be king, he becomes very even more angrier and he becomes even more bitter towards God. And he becomes extremely angry and jealous of David. Because uh, Saul would love for his son to be king. But remember, God said, nope, it's not going to be him. It's going to be David. And so what happens is Saul goes on the hunt, literally hunting for, for David. And he was trying to find David so that he could kill him. Because he was so jealous uh, of him. He was so bitter. He was so angry. 
that he wanted to destroy David. But twice, twice, okay, one time uh, David and, and his men were hiding in a cave, hiding from Saul and his army. David's in a cave hiding. They see them coming, and they're just kind of waiting in the dark. Guess what Saul does? Saul says, hey, bathroom break, and he goes, actually goes into the cave where, where David and his men are hiding, and David's men are like, no way. Look, look, take him. This is it. This is it. Okay? But that's where, where David says, listen, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put my hand against him. Okay? Then there's another time. There's another time where actually David and, and, and Abishai actually get into Saul's tent. Okay? The whole Saul and his army, they're all sound asleep. The only thing that you hear is 3,000 men snoring. Okay? And so they're walking up there, and, and, they, and they get to Saul, and he's in his tent, and there's, a, there's a, 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 a jar of water next to him. And guess what's right next to Saul's head? His spear. His spear. No one knows they're in there. Everyone is sound asleep, including Saul. And that's where Abishai goes, hey, listen, um, do not, this, is, this has got to be it. This has to be it. And David said, no. No. This, what, whatever we feel about this man, this is God's appointed leader. And I will not take out someone who God has placed in authority. David had the perfect opportunity to kill Saul. Even, like I said, even his men were, were saying, David, this has to be from God. But David wouldn't do it. And see, here's the deal. Choosing to kill Saul at those two moments would have been easy. Would have been easy. But here's the big thing. It wouldn't have been right. It wouldn't have been right. It wasn't in God's plan for David to take the throne that way. And David could have completely missed out on his reign as king had he chosen to follow his own desires instead of the desires of God. So the question is, what do we miss because we choose to disobey God? Do we miss an opportunity maybe to point someone to Christ? Do we miss opportunities uh, to maybe invite someone to church? Do we miss a, a word from God? Um, do, do we miss a special, maybe we miss a, a, a date night or something special with our spouse because we've let work take a, an unhealthy priority? Do we miss a, a special time with our kids or, or, or spending, spending time with our kids because we, we're just too selfish and involved with other stuff? Do, do, we miss, do we miss a chance to be a blessing to someone? Do we miss a chance to, to extend grace or forgiveness to someone because we want to hold on to that bitterness and anger? Do we miss God's purpose for our lives because we're too busy pursuing our own purposes. Choosing to take matters into his own hands, guess what? It cost Saul everything. And so what, what price are you willing to pay if you choose to ignore God? The good news is this. The good news is choosing to follow God is choosing to live under his strength, his blessing, and his direction. You see, David knew this early on. He, he didn't just come to this realization when he was king. He knew this. He, he, he knew this as a young boy. In 1 Samuel 17, 45 through 47, it says this. David said to the Philistine, and the Philistine that he's talking to is Goliath, by the way. You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled or defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Oh, what would you like to hear that? This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. This is the awesome story of David and Goliath, and David is a teenager when this happens. Every other soldier in the Philistine or in the Israelite army is afraid of this guy, is afraid of Goliath. But David knew who he belonged to, and he knew who he was fighting for. And it's, it's kind of hard not to get pumped up when you read the, those verses where it says, You come at me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I'm coming with the Lord Almighty God. Which, by the way, you've made mad. You've defiled him. And David knew, but here's the deal. David knew no matter what happened that day on that battlefield, that God was going to be victorious. And I love that right away, David is not saying, listen, I'm going to come over here and mess you up. You just get ready for this. Look at this slingshot. You're intimidated. You aren't you? No, he doesn't do that. He says, I'm coming over here because uh, I fight 
for the Lord. You've defied the Lord God Almighty. So you shouldn't really be worried about me. You should be worried about God. And really, the story is not David versus Goliath. You know what it is? It's God versus his enemies. And David knows God never loses. And I believe that we can choose to trust God because the same God that gave David the boldness and the strength and gave him that victory that day is the same God who's fighting for you and he's fighting for me. He's the same God that wants to give us that victory. I guarantee you if David went after Goliath in his own strength, and if he went after it in his own power, if he went after Goliath without God, that would have been the quickest fight ever. Way quicker than any Mike Tyson fight ended. And it wouldn't have been pretty for David and it wouldn't have been pretty for the Israelite army. But how many times do we choose to run the other way when God is telling us to stay and fight? How many times do we let fear win when God is telling us, I am with you? David's choice to follow God gave the Israelites victory that day. But imagine if he'd stayed back. Imagine if he'd stayed back with his brothers and the rest of the army and go, no, no way. Mm-mm. That's a big guy. That is, that's a huge guy. How would that have changed things? We don't need to be afraid to choose to follow God because he's, he's always going to make a way. Because that's what God does. He makes the impossible possible for people who follow him, for people who obey him, who have faith in him. Listen to this verse. This is such a great company verse. Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord uh, their hope and their confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. You should highlight that verse, memorize that verse, put it on your mirror. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord. Now, was David perfect? Far from it. But here's what I love about God. Our negative choices, they come with consequences. Yes, they come with consequences, but they don't have to disqualify you. They don't have to disqualify you. Some of you remember, if you know the story of David, that he had an affair and then murdered the lady's husband who he had the affair with. Now, that choice took David down some roads uh, that he had to deal with for the rest of his life. He had to deal with, con- deal with the consequences for that choice for the rest of his life. But instead of becoming bitter, instead of becoming angry, or instead of deciding to quit, what he did was, is David turned to God. Psalm 51, 10 through 13, it says, God, this is David pleading to God after he's been confronted by his sin. God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me. And sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. Then I will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners return to you. You see, despite David's, despite David's actions, God's love never wavered for him. And despite our own actions, God's love never wavers for us. And David knew that. He knew he'd blown it. He knew that he had absolutely blown it. And he knew that the only way that his life would amount to anything was if he humbled himself and went straight to God to beg for forgiveness and to make a new start. And for some of you here today, this is, this is why you came to this, to this. This is what God wants to tell you. Your negative choices, they will have consequences, but they don't have to keep you from being used by God and allowing God to create a clean heart and begin a new chapter in your life. Some of you look at your past or look at your choices or your current reality and saying, there's no way. But let this be a reminder to you. God makes that way possible. 1 John 1, 8 through 9 says, If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. The truth is is that we're all sinners. Verse 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. We're all sinners, but because of God's love, Jesus died on a cross to pay for our sins so that we could be forgiven and so we could have a brand new new start your choices come with consequences but they don't have to disqualify you here's how i want to close and our worship team can go ahead and come up here's how i want to close you have this card go ahead and take this card and if you if you've lost yours there's some blank ones up here you can come up here and get them in just a minute um so 
what, what I want you to do is, on one side of the card, I want you to write down something that God has been asking you to do or to stop doing. Something that God has, has been asking you to do or stop doing. And then on the other side, here's what I want you to write. I want you to write the main excuse that you've been giving God as to why you're not doing what God is asking you to do. So on one side, I want you to write down what's something that God has is been asking you to do or maybe asking you to stop doing. And on the other side, what I want you to do is write down the main excuse that you've been giving to God as to why you're not being obedient. And um, Jeff is going to be playing. Our worship team is going to be singing. And here's what I want you to do. When you finish that, I want you to come, and I want you to come up to this altar, and I want you to lay this card down. Okay? Don't put your name on it. Don't put your name on it. But I want you to take this, and because here's, here's what this is. I, I want to give us an immediate application to what we've just heard, right? We said that our choices take us all somewhere. Our decisions lead us somewhere. And this decision, whatever, you, whatever, whatever you've written, this decision to the excuse that you've given God, that's taking you somewhere, and it's not taking you to where he wants you to be. So let's, let's apply what we've just heard immediately. Remember, God says, let's not just be hearers of the word, but let's be doers. So let's be doers of his word. Let's write down the thing that he's been asking us to do or asking us to stop doing. Let's write down the excuse. And then with, with just a, 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 a time of just, this is kind of a symbol to say, God, I know where this decision is taking me and I want to stop. Or I know where this decision is taking me and I want to start and I want to obey you. So that's what you want to do. Write one side, what's one thing God's telling you to do or stop doing? Write the excuse why you haven't been doing it, and then I want you to bring And when you drop it off here, you can drop it right here, and you can leave. You can drop it and stay and pray for a little bit. Our worship team's going to be leading us during this time, okay? But I just, I just, I just think it's important that we do something about what we just heard.